Happy Easter, everybody. It's time to A some cues. Let's go. Oh, did I show you my new phone case? Shameless plug. I am so self-indulgent. Let's see, uh, on the first question, we will start with uh, the comments on the previous Q&A video uh, that I released in January. On that video, the Loverboys901 asked, should Disney make an Epcot-themed risk game with Test Track, uh, Test Track representing Australia? Now, I approve of Disney Park-themed reskins of every board game ever made, but the top priority should be a Settlers of Catan version where you're building on the Florida Swampland or on Anaheim Orange Groves. I will not back down from this. Uh, A-Land, or Al-Land, asks, Have you watched Milo Murphy's Law and have you watched the crossover with Phineas and Ferb? Uh, I answered this in the comments already, but yes to both. Milo Murphy's Law will be the subject of a future Dave's obsession to the moment. Uh, which is better for a movie, Journey into Imagination or Cranium Command? Well, a Cranium Command movie would pretty much be Inside Out, since uh, before directing Inside Out, Pete Docter was an animator on Cranium Command, and uh, he has gone on record that Cranium Command was an influence. So we do know that the concept of Cranium Command can work as a movie, but I don't know, I, I do think that uh, Dreamfinder and Figment have a lot of untapped potential for a uh, grand, fantastic adventure. Um, I haven't read the Figment comic book yet, but I hear good things, so, you know, there can be long-form stories with them. So, yeah, I'd like to see where they go with that, but the answer is both. Uh, which deserves a ride? Doraemon at Universal, or Doraemon at Disney, or Nostalgia Critic at Universal? I don't know anything about one of those things, and I don't associate with the other one anymore, so... I'm gonna say Charlie the Unicorn at Busch Gardens Tampa. Will there be a big update for the stuff that's happened since the park reviews? Someday I do want to go back to Florida, and on that day I'll film a big uh, Stuff That's Changed series for the stuff that's changed in the park since the original Dave Does Disney and Blitz Travaganza. And then knowing me, I'll probably have that edited six years later after a whole different batch of stuff has changed. And those are the questions from the comments of the previous Q&A. Now we go to questions from Patreon. Because you paid to have your questions read second. Gold Annie Ranger asks, are you, Charlie, and Tony going to do any more riffs like the Disneyland opening day telecast? Uh, we want to. Uh, we actually have a few more uh, targets in mind that we are very much looking forward to riffing once our schedules align and we don't have any other big projects taking us away from them. But uh, there's some stuff we really want to riff that's that I think is going to be a lot of fun. And um, that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, Curtis Charles asks, any thought on the new Star Wars attractions? I'm excited for them. They seem to be groundbreaking in a way that we haven't seen in Anaheim since Indy. Uh, I'm very excited for the new ride systems and the new Star Wars adventures and the level of immersion that they say they're committing to. I'm less excited for what the crowds are going to be like for the first, oh, five years of the attraction's existence, but what are you going to do? Michael Hamilton asks, do you have any plans to visit the East Smithsonian again in the future? Uh, no immediate plans, but uh, I'm sure I will be back in DC at some point over the next few years, and I'll probably pop into the Smithsonian again, and maybe I'll vlog something because the internet craves content. This is what I do with my life now. Anyway, now on to questions from the YouTube community tab. Um, Matthew Witcher asks, when is Blood Stravifornia coming out? as soon as possible. Um, I did make a resolution that I'm going to try to at least start releasing it in 2019, and so far I'm committed to sticking to that resolution, or at least trying to. Um, the thing is, it is the most ambitious thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, there's a lot in it that's collaborative, but it's still mostly just me in post-production, and there are a couple of corners I backed myself into due to poor planning that I'm sort of wiggling my way out of. It's it's minutia that I'll go over when it's out, the things that are hard to explain, but um, I promise I'm working on it. I'll let you know as soon as possible. I'm sorry I've let you down. Andrew Cooter asks, what is your earliest memory of visiting a Disney park? My first trip to Disneyland was in 1992. I was four or five years old, uh, Toontown was still under construction, and the Disney afternoon overlays were still strewn about Fantasyland. The first ride I ever rode was Peter Pan's Flight, and my life was changed forever. 
I have some even vaguer memories of visiting Knott's Berry Farm and Sesame Place in Pennsylvania at an even younger age, but those memories are very vague. But you've seen pictures of the Sesame Place one. At least you have if you watched the Blitztravaganza. You did watch the Blitztravaganza, right? Thespis64 asks, what's your opinion on the hopefully upcoming Back to the Future the Musical? Uh, I'm generally in favor of movies being adapted to the Broadway stage, and I'm generally in favor of more Back to the Future related things being out there. Um, there are a lot of elements from the movie that I think would be difficult to translate to the stage, but then again, apparently Broadway has the most impressive King Kong I've ever seen. I hear the show's not great, but that Kong looks really cool, so anything's possible. But the bigger reason I'm cautious about this notion is Back to the Future is already a really musical movie for a non-musical. The soundtrack is such an intrinsic part of the film's identity. Between Johnny B. Good and Huey Lewis and Alan Silvestri's flawless score, like, the musical identity of the film is so distinct and specific. And so whoever's writing new songs with Back to the Future branding really has a huge task ahead of them, because I don't know if I can picture, uh, in my mind, I don't know if I can picture, like, Broadway songs that make for good musical numbers, but still sound like they fit in with the Back to the Future world. But anything that gets produced with Back to the Future branding does need to get the sign-off from Zemeckis and Gale, and I'm not saying they've never approved a mediocre spin-off, but I'm just saying they take the responsibility of protecting the movie very seriously, and so if something has gotten to the point where it gets to the stage, that means Zemeckis and Gale deemed it worthy of existing, and they've been wrong about that before maybe, but still, uh, they're probably harsher critics about this sort of thing than I am, so if it actually gets to the point where it's produced, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Andrew Brandenburg asked, is there a ride you'd like to see completely demolished with no replacement? For me, it's the flying carpets of Aladdin in the Magic Kingdom. So generally, I have the attitude of, if I don't like a ride, I still don't want to take it away from the people who do like it. But I get what you mean about those uh, Aladdin carpets. They are very awkwardly placed. They make traffic a nightmare. And they're just visually so tacky in what is otherwise a rather lovely adventure land. And, like, how many Dumbo spinners does one park need? So, yeah, I get what you mean. I would not be sad to see the Aladdin carpets go. I feel the same way about, like, Astro Orbiter. Like, they were much less of a traffic hazard, you know, when Star Jets was on top of the People Mover track. So, those... I don't know if I would say I want to see them get demolished, but I would definitely like them both to be moved to a more convenient, less obtrusive location. <laughs> Um, I feel the same way, I'm, I, well, I mean, that's the thing, is, like, I can't think of anything else that I want to see gone with no replacement. Like, I want to see Chester and Hester's Dinorama gone, but I do want to see it get replaced with something better and worthy of the surrounding area. Oh, hey, it's Al and Leal again. Uh, what theme park ride from Disney would you like as a movie? Now, obviously, the Guillermo del Toro Haunted Mansion movie, but aside from that, uh, I always thought Big Thunder Mountain had a lot of potential, uh... And I know that uh, apparently at one point there was a pilot for a Big Thunder Mountain TV series, uh, but it was when ABC was looking for another Lost, so it was like this, you know, heavy, mysterious, supernatural thing set in Big Thunder Mountain. And, I mean, I know Thunder Mountain has some supernatural elements in the ride uh, based on certain interpretations and now just full out addressed uh, by the Disneyland Railway, but it still kind of feels like square peg in a round hole, but... I'd be curious to see that pilot if it really was produced, or even just read the script if it's out there anywhere. Margaret asks, do you think you'll make any more vaguely Connecticut-related videos? Probably someday. I hope to visit Connecticut again within the next few years, and I'm sure I will vlog at least enough to write off the trip. Uh, maybe Dave does lake compounds? I don't know. I, I like Connecticut. I liked growing up there. I, I know it's kind of a nothing state, but, uh... It's still partially home to me. Steven asks, have you ever thought about doing a video, say a Dave's obsession of the moment, but never had time to fully make it? There are certainly obsessions, lists, and sketches that I haven't gotten around to making yet, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are because I'm still planning on making them someday, maybe. Laura Knightley asks, are Pop-Tarts ravioli? I don't know, but a pizza roll definitely is. 
And now we go to questions from Instagram, where you should be following me if you want to see me post a bunch of pictures from Disneyland. That's pretty much all I use Instagram for. Coaster King asks, what will come out first, Blitz Ravifornia or Some Jerk Season 4? Come on everyone, have a little patience. You just had Game of Thrones come back. Just watch that until these two of us who are one-man operations who bit off way more than we can chew are ready to present our stuff to you. Just, please. We're very tired. Uh, my buddy Brian from Scary Farm asks, uh, your favorite scare during the last Scary Farm season in Dark Ride? Well, my favorite moment in Dark Ride was telling Tony Baxter I loved his work, but, uh, honestly, my favorite scare was with you, Brian, the person asking this question. Uh, there was one night where it was you and I both in the maintenance room sort of tag teaming and we'd trade off where one of us would be the distraction and then the other one would be the pop scare and we'd just have all the fun with the drunk teenagers. That was a really great day and we really got to be really creative and fun with, uh, with the scares we were doing. I like Scary Farm. It's a fun place to work. And now where most of you ask questions, Twitter, where you should be following me if you want to see me retweet people who are funnier than me. Fry for Bridge asks, you have a time machine that can only take you to theme parks, which park, when, and why? I would love to see the early days of Epcot that the Epcult fell in love with. I want to see Horizons and Magic Journeys and the original Journey into Imagination. Um, aside from that, uh, I would love to revisit attractions that I don't get to ride anymore. I'd love to get a chance to ride the Great Movie Ride one more time. I'd love to go back to Universal Orlando and uh, re-ride tra uh, Terminator 2 3D and Jaws and Back to the Future. Two of those I could also do at Universal Hollywood, but you know what I mean. Uh, just go back and get a chance to revisit attractions that I loved that just aren't there anymore. Oh, the other one is uh, Alien Encounter at Magic Kingdom. I never got to ride that before it got replaced with Stitch. I'd love to go back and check that out in person because as far as I can tell, none of the YouTube videos even come close to doing that justice. What are your thoughts on the latest reveals for Galaxy's Edge, including the Coca-Cola partnership? Now, you all know that I'm a Coke addict, and uh, so obviously I'm happy that Coca-Cola will be available in the land. And as much as I'm holding out hope that they find a way to narratively justify a freestyle machine, um, I think the bottle designs look really cool. I love those canteen designs. Uh, the only downside is making Coca-Cola canon in the Star Wars universe and making Batu a Coke planet means we're probably not getting a meet and greet with Marfa Lump. Oh no, Darth Maul! <laughs> my brains are spilling out! Fun fact, I still have all my Phantom Menace Pepsi cans in the garage somewhere because I'm a hoarder. Bluey asks, besides King's Quest, name another four favorite games of yours. Monkey Island, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Super Mario World, and Portal. Uh, advice to other content creators. Now, I've been uploading videos to YouTube off and on since 2006, and uh, the total income I got from YouTube in 2018 was $51.26 from Patreon, so... I might not be the best person to give advice to you if you're actually looking to do this professionally. So I'll just say, make sure you're having fun with it, and if you're not having fun with the process, make sure you're at least creating a product you're proud of, but if you're not proud of it, don't be too ashamed because every failure is a learning experience, and I don't know, it's just all a bunch of platitudes that seem contradictory at first. This might be why I only made $51 last year. How was the process for creating the Disneyland opening day riff like? Uh, we originally intended on releasing it on the 60th anniversary of Disneyland, and the uh, sketch that Tony did release on the 60th anniversary uh, was actually originally written to be the cold open of the riff, um, but then just time ran away from us. So in 2015, we did have one like group writing session where we all got together to watch the special and we made it about a third of the way through but we were tossing out jokes and writing them down and then uh, basically over the next several months we individually watched the special a couple of times and you know took down our notes and then we had one last group watching day where we just kept watching the special pausing writing down our observations and jokes and then Tony had uh, all of our notes and he compiled them into the script we got then we recorded it and tony edited it and the rest is history 
Sam Ratner asks, favorite movies in the Disney animated canon besides Beauty and the Beast? Uh, Sleeping Beauty, Jungle Book, Great Mouse Detective, and The Emperor's New Groove. I don't know how much of uh, those choices is based on the, the actual merits of the film and how much is just based on nostalgia, but it's the Disney animated canon. It's basically all influenced by nostalgia on one level or another. Um, on a similar note, who are your top 10 Disney princesses other than Belle? And yes, honorary princesses count. So if honorary princesses count, Bob Cummings. Uh, Carson Ibera asks, what are your thoughts on MST3K, The Return, and The Gauntlet? I liked both seasons a lot. They were really, really fun. Um, there were some new uh, visual style elements that took a little getting used to, but I actually do believe that if the show had continued since the 90s, uh, the show would have organically evolved into looking something like this, uh, especially if Joel had been back at the helm at any point. Um, actually, the biggest adjustment uh, in the new seasons was the fact that it was now an L.A. writing staff instead of a Midwest writing staff, so there were slightly different sensibilities. But it was still an L.A. writing staff that mostly grew up on MST3K, so the sensibilities had a hybrid of that Midwest and that L.A. sensibility. And uh, L.A. nerds writing means that there were uh, way more theme park references, so that's always happy for me. Um, the celebrity cameos were hit and miss, but the host segments on MST3K have always been hit and miss. I actually think the biggest missed opportunity of the return was that you had Bill and Kevin on set playing Brain Guy and Bobo. You couldn't have uh, had them start out playing Crow and Servo, and then we actually see the moment where their software gets upgraded and uh, Crow and Servo become Hampton and Baron. I don't know, it just would have been a minor bit of fan service, but it... it could have been a fun moment. <laughs> Best host, Servo and Crow. I can't choose favorites. I love what they all brought to the table. I love how Joel was more of the father figure to the bots and uh, Jonah and Mike were both more of older brothers to the bots. I also love how, you know, Trace was more of just the childlike, chaotic, destructive Crow, whereas Bill was more of the outright aggressive, like, New York Crow. And I thought Hampton sort of blended the two pretty well. And obviously it's hard to accept people other than Kevin as Servo, just because he was Servo for so long. But I still appreciate uh, going back to Josh episodes and hearing him sort of find the early genesis of the character. And I think Baron really uh, captured the suave essence of Servo. So even though it took a little bit of time for me to get used to a new voice for Servo. I did think he embodied the character pretty well right off the bat. But if I had to choose a favorite Servo and Crow, obviously it's James Moore and Paul Chaplin in those animated shorts that Jim Mallon produced, definitely because he had a creative vision for them and not just because he was trying to cash in on a resurgent interest in the MST2K trademark after Rift Tracks and Cinematic Titanic were hitting the scene. I got these, uh, you know. What? Non-functional arms. Oh. For the most part. Tough break. That was mean to James Moore and Paul Chaplin. They did their best with what they were tasked to do. It's not their fault Jim Mallon was just an opportunist douchebag. Chandler asks, what's your favorite of the hour-long Phineas and Ferb specials? I'll tell you in the next D-list. Uh, Chandler also asks, what Phineas and Ferb invention and what Doofenshmirtz innator would you want in real life and why? Well, for Phineas and Ferb Invention, obviously I want a roller coaster in my backyard, slash any of the other theme park attractions they built. And uh, as for Innators, well, my favorite invention of Doofs is Norm, but that's just because I love the character, not necessarily because uh, the invention was so great. But I tell you, when I was working in food service, I really could have used the Make Up Your Mind Innator, but I would have been fired and then arrested if I used it on the customers. Uh, Jonathan Aylbeck asks, if you had to go back in time to ride a ride during the year it opened, what year it would be? I would love to see Indy when all the effects were working, including the dry ice. I mean, I know we've gotten new effects since then that are cool, but it just would have been cool to see. Um, I also would love to see Everest while the Yeti was working. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I would love to see the good version of Journey into Imagination. Alexander Klepp asks, what are your favorite sitcoms? Uh, let's narrow it down to just multi-camera sitcoms for the sake of the question. So, 
News Radio, Cheers, Frasier, Seinfeld, uh, Faulty Towers, The Dick Van Dyke Show, and about 75% of How I Met Your Mother. Uh, my friend Kate asks, favorite Futurama episode or movie? That is really tough to narrow down, and that honestly probably should be an upcoming D-list where I talk about all my favorite Futurama episodes. But I think my favorite Futurama scene is from Calculon 2.0 where they're resurrecting Calculon. That, that kills me every single time. Um, what is your favorite coaster in any park? Now for overall experience, I love Space Mountain at Disneyland, but that has more to do with the uh, soundtrack than the coaster track. So if we're talking just based on roller coaster construction alone, uh, maybe Ghost Rider at Knott's. That is a lot of fun. It is very intense, but in a way that doesn't make me feel physically ill the way some intense roller coasters do. Uh, do the Muppets deserve more presence at the parks and why is the answer yes? I stand by what I said in the Hollywood Studios episode of Dave Does Disney. The Muppets deserve their own entire park. Build the great Muppet movie ride. Give Muppet Vision a permanent home that's never in danger of closing. And put in a Pigs in Space simulator. Put in everything. Just Muppet everything. Put in a Pizza Rizzo that is decorated with actual characters and not just funny words on signs and stuff. Do justice to the Muppets theme parks. Uh, Ryan Walterson asks, favorite Muppet, favorite Sesame Street Muppet, and favorite Fraggle Rock Muppet? Why are you making me choose? <sighs> Off the top of my head, uh, Fozzie, Forgetful Jones, and Convincing John. That's what I'm going with right now, but my answer will change next time. Uh, Casey asks, what is your current microphone and camera you use to film videos? I have a couple of cameras and mics, but the ones I use most frequently, in fact the one I'm using right now, is a... Canon Rebel T5i and a Boya BYPVM 1000, apparently. Um, they were both Christmas gifts from my parents, who are way more supportive of my nonsense than I deserve. And uh, links to Amazon purchase in the description. Affiliate links, because I only made $51 last year. Egregious Knives asks, what's the one Disney movie you think could most benefit from a live-action remake, and who would you have direct it? Black Cauldron, directed by Taika Waititi. Uh, Ryan Hip asks, how much did it cost you to make Bravo Land look that convincing? Only my soul. Uh, Matt Mann asks, what's your favorite joke from Dave Does Disney slash Blitztravaganza, and looking back, would you change any joke? I think I talked about this in the previous Q&A, but basically my favorite joke changes each time, but I do end up coming back to the uh, Knickerbocker rant a lot. I That was very funny, and I'm comfortable saying that because I didn't write it, so it's not egocentric of me to say it. Uh, and as for a joke I would do differently now, so many of them, some of them because my sensibilities have changed, some of them just because I thought of a funnier joke since then, and some of them because I just thought of a slightly better wording that's slightly less clunky, and yeah, you know, I'm always way too proud and also way too ashamed of my work at the same time, like all good content creators. And like all good content creators, I call it content because that doesn't devalue it at all. Jacob Caruso asks, what would your dream Muppet ride experience at the parks be? Again, entire Muppet Park. Give us all of it. But uh, if we're going for things that are actually achievable, I refer you to episode one of Armchair Imagineering. Uh, Brandon Croker asks, what are your favorite Weird Al songs and your favorite Weird Al moment in general? My favorite Weird Al song is Skipper Dan, not just because it's a Disneyland reference, but also because it captured an existential dread I was feeling in the moment the song was released. It was uh, released the summer right after I graduated from college and my life seemed to be going nowhere. And here we are 10 years later and my life still seems to be going slight places, but places they should have gone a long time ago. But, hey, can't live in the past. Uh, my favorite Weird Al moment, very hard to choose because there have been so many great ones. Um, does just the entirety of UHF count as a moment? I'm going to say it does because then I don't have to think any longer about uh, trying to select a moment. Uh, JD asks, if you could pick a movie for MST3K to riff, what movie and which host would you choose? I think the Giant Claw would have been perfect for a Joel-era episode, but I will settle for it being a Jonah-era episode. I don't know if a widescreen print of Giant Claw exists, though, so uh, it might be off the table based on their new policies. But uh, 
Uh, crossing fingers for either MST3K or Rift Tracks to do Giant Claw at some point. How often do you revisit Mango Joe's at SeaWorld? I have not been back to SeaWorld on either coast since I shot the last day of shooting for the Blitztravaganza, uh, all the on-camera stuff. I went uh, with my dad who came into town basically the day after I stopped working there. We went down, shot all that stuff. Haven't been back to SeaWorld since, but uh, if I end up in SeaWorld again, of course I will stop by Mango Joe's and pay my respects, see what's changed. I hear that between writing that rant and releasing that video, the menu changed so that they did have burgers, and who knows how many times it's changed since then. Cheerful Miss Maggie asks, if you could choose to riff on another vintage Disney special with Tony and Charlie, which would you choose? Uh, we do have a few that we are planning on riffing already, as I mentioned already. We've, we've got a couple in our sights, and I can't tell you what they are, but I am very excited about them, because uh, nothing uh, with the level of technical incompetence that made uh, the opening day special so fun, but there are some specials that just get weird, and uh, that's a whole separate kind of fun. Uh, Mariah asks a couple of questions. What was your typical order when you still work for the Coffee Mermaids? A grande iced white mocha. Favorite theme park snack? One per major corporation. Uh, Dole Whip for Disney, Boysenberry Punch for Knott's, and Butterbeer for Universal. I tend to go for drinks more than food when I'm in the parks. If you could add another song to Mission Breakout, what would you pick? That is a really good question. <clears throat> I'm gonna say the boys are back in town. I, I could see that working really well, but yeah, when Rocket unplugs you and starts things rocking down, da -da 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 down. Th that would fit perfectly. That that should be there already. Mikey Insanity asks why. I'll let Lou take this one. Because oh, he's centerfield. He's Jamie asks if you were able to get a full backstage tour of a theme park ride. What ride would it be and why? I'll take any backstage tour I'm offered, but obviously I'd love to see Indy from backstage. Um, I did see Transformers backstage once, back when Charlie was allowed to take us backstage, or whether he was allowed to or not, he did back then, but I am told he is no longer allowed to do it, but it was pretty cool to see. Uh, it, it was mostly office corridors and stuff, but still cool to see behind the magic. Um, Jared asks, which McElroy family member is your favorite? The fourth brother, Lin-Manuel Miranda. All right, that wraps up this batch of questions. Uh, I'll do another one of these in a couple months, probably. And until then, have a happy Easter. And this is Dave, signing off.